I, this 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 voice makes me crazy. But anyway, all right. And then I do the sharing. Okay. So the first subject is why you want to study quantum field theory at all. And uh, I already made some speech, speech about this in uh, looking at the history of uh, physics. But anyway, to me, the reason I sort of agreed to give uh, this uh, uh, experimental course on quantum field theory at the undergraduate level is because I remembered the frustration I had when I was taking quantum mechanics course back in, in undergrad myself. And frustration was the following. So when I went to the first class on quantum mechanics, the, the instructor gave me a bunch of motivations why I should study quantum mechanics. And the instructor listed a bunch of things, like, well, when you look at the atoms and you, you look at the emission of photons coming from atomic transitions, you see this discrete energy spectrum. And certainly, it, I learned that you can solve Schrodinger equation, find the energy levels of a hydrogen atom, and the gap between the energy levels would correspond to the energy of the photon that get emitted from the excited states of hydrogen atom. So that made sense to me. But Schrodinger equation didn't allow me to really compute the process itself. How exactly an excited state of atom would emit a photon to go down to the ground state. Because for that purpose, you need to describe a photon. And to describe a photon, you need to quantize electromagnetic field. And that is actually the quantum field theory. So that was a huge frustration on my side. I was told to study quantum mechanics because we wanted to understand this, but it was never explained to me in quantum mechanics class. Same goes with the photoelectric effect. And photoelectric effect was the reason why classical mechanics was proven not to work. If you're trying to shine light on material to kick the electrons out, classical mechanics tells you that if you make the light bright enough, then there must be enough energy to kick the electron out of the metals or whatever material you got, but they don't come out. So you learn that energy of a single photon has to be large enough so that you can knock out the electron from the material, and that's a photoelectric effect, namely that there's a limitation because energy of the photon is quantized in one photon, two photon, three photons, and they were continuous. And that's why just the bright enough light is not enough to kick an electron out. That's the photoelectric effect. Again, to understand this properly, we need to quantize the electromagnetic field to get a photon. Compton scattering is even worse. You are talking about relativistic scattering of electron and photon and to understand Compton scattering. And this was quoted as an evidence that the, it really shows the, the, uh, the, uh, the energy of the photon is a meant to be energy of a particle. That's why it depends on the reference frame. When you put the photon in, and when a photon comes out, they have different wavelengths. And so that was quoted as evidence for the uh, particle nature of the photon. Again, I never see that in quantum mechanics class. And other things that were explained in quantum mechanics class, I was happy with. For example, Stone-Gallagher experiment that shows the spin is quantized. And so that's something you study in quantum mechanics class. The matter waves interfere. You can talk about electron behaving as a wave and in probability so that they shows the interference pattern in a double slit experiment. These things had been taught and I was very happy to learn that stuff. But the first three I never did. So that was the frustration I had myself when I was studying quantum mechanics. I don't know if you felt the same frustration when you were uh, taking quantum mechanics class. Some class tries to do sort of uh, in, uh, pretend to do this in, in sort of a, a half-baked fashion. Maybe you have seen such discussions in your quantum mechanics class as well. But as far as I understand, at least in Berkeley, 137 ne never really does full-blown quantization of electromagnetic field. So that's the frustration I had myself, and I hope that's the frustration I can actually uh, fill uh, by, uh, 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 in this course. And once you actually get to the question of quantizing the field, it raises this interesting conceptual question about particle wave duality. So uh, when you study physics, 
up to the level of, let's say, high school or maybe some of the, the uh, freshman physics, that the electron used to be a particle. And that's the way we learn about it first, at least. But now you know that it's a wave too. So something what we used to think as a particle behaves like a wave. But at the same time, the electromagnetic wave, as the name says, I used to be a wave as a prediction of Maxwell's equation. And so, uh, as you know, there was a huge debate about what carries the light, uh, what uh, uh, is the substance that carries it. People speculate about the ether and so on and so forth. Now we know the electromagnetic wave wave can propagate through just a pure vacuum. Uh, so we don't need ether for this. But nonetheless, it's a wave. But when you got, get to these uh, three things I mentioned on the previous slide, the photon was needed. So electromagnetic wave was a classical description of it, but now we have to accept the fact that it behaves like a particle too. So at the end of the day, everything is both a wave and a particle at the same time. So this is what we call particle wave duality. So the question is, how do we describe such a thing? And the laws of physics is described by the language we humans invented. And the language we humans can conceive of have been influenced by our daily experience. And in our daily experience, wave and particles are different things. So we don't have a good language to describe something which is both a wave and particle at the same time. So this is the limitation of our, us humankind, not the limitations of the laws of nature or a mother nature. So, but we have to come up with a language to describe that. And that has been very difficult and people struggled with it. So the best we can do is to pick particle or wave as quote unquote correct classical limit. And we start with that and then try to make it broader at the end of the day to encompass the other side. So which one we take as a starting point in some sense is a matter of convenience. So we need to pick wave or particle as the beginning, as a classical description. Then we put quantum into it so that we can do both at the end of the day. So which one is the right one? And definitely people tried both. And quantum field theory chooses wave as the starting point of discussion. So we take this idea that everything is a wave as the beginning. Then we put h bar into it. Then out comes particles. So that's the way we describe what is wave and particle at the same time using quantum field theory. And this is the opposite from what you have learned so far in quantum mechanics class. In quantum mechanics, you start with particles. Then you quantize it, and out comes the Schrodinger wave equation. So this is the way you describe something that behaves as particle and wave at the same time, and that was very successful. You now understand the spectrum of atomic levels, quantization spin, and all that stuff. So it, it is successful that way too. But it turns out that that doesn't work when you get to photon and also many other phenomena. So people actually tried to stick with this idea that you start with particles, quantize it, and they get the waves out, even in many different contexts, including relativistic systems. And we will come back and talk about actually in the second half of this class, and it didn't quite work out. So that's why we switched to the other choice which was counterintuitive to most people, I'm sure back then in 40s and 50s, but this turned out to be the correct choice, which is very successful, as I mentioned earlier. So this is counterintuitive and very different from what, what you have done in quantum mechanics class so far, but this is what we're going to do. We take wave as a starting point, quantize a wave, and particle would come out after the quantization. And so that requires some switch in your mindset on how you deal with the quantum physics. And we try to go through this as, as clearly as possible. And I definitely that would cause some confusion on insight. 
And I was confused when I first started, I started it myself. I understand how this can be very confusing. So again, this is the place where you are welcome to speak up, be vocal about what confusions you might have, what doesn't make sense, what doesn't make sense. And, and so uh, I appreciate feedback on this. But anyway, I'm giving a, a, a basically the upshot on what's coming. The quantum field theory is a theory of waves. And when you put quantum into it, the particles will come out in such a way that you can deal with this very strange objects that behave as a wave and particle at the same time. That's beyond the human language, but this is the way we can describe this kind of funny situation. Which brings up actually an interesting question too. So we don't see electron as a wave. So what is the point of describing this kind of matter particles as a wave as a starting point? It turns out that there are systems where behavior of matter is really described in terms of a classical wave in the quantum limit. So this is an oxymoron. Quantum physics is a classical wave. But I will give you an example of this, which happens to be the Bose-Einstein condensate. So I will give you the first half of the class will be about actually non-relativistic systems that you don't have to worry about relativity, but you see how using wave turns out to be actually the right language to describe the behavior of matter in some regime. So that taking wave as a starting point is not crazy because that's something we see in experiment in certain settings and quantize it to get particle out actually does make sense at the end of the day. So this is again, this is something that requires a change in the mindset. We started with particle first and got wave out, but now we do uh, wave first and get particle out. And you see that will come out uh, in, in a couple of lectures. So uh, this is something that's coming actually quite soon. So this is a new mindset you need. And there are also specific reasons why we had to go to quantum field theory rather than trying to extend a quantum mechanics. So the first thing is to realize is, and again, this is something I will talk uh, about at length, is that when you look at the quantum field theory without relativity, it turns out this is just a reformulation of multi-particle quantum mechanics. So at the level of non-relativistic physics, quantum field theory and quantum mechanics are just exactly the same thing. But then you might ask the question, then why bother? If that's the same thing, it, it, we can stick with the familiar quantum mechanics, right? But it turns out that there is a very good reason why you want to go to quantum field theory. And I think towards maybe the, the second half or uh, towards the end of quantum, uh, quantum mechanics class, you will learn about quantum statistics. And if you have multi-particle system, you write the Schrodinger wave function with arguments where each argument corresponds to the positions of each particle in your system. So if you have n particles, you have n arguments for your Schrodinger uh, 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 wave function. And when two particles are identical, you can interchange them and that should not change the probability. So absolute squared of psi shouldn't change when you interchange two particles if they are identical. And what that means is that when you change two particles, then all you can do is to change the sign of the wave function. And when you're dealing with fermions, like electrons, when you interchange two electrons, wave function changes its sign with minus sign. When you interchange two bosons, it doesn't change the sign. So the wave function is either symmetric or anti-symmetric. But this is something you have to impose by hand. If you have just arbitrary n-particle system, if they are not identical to each other, then you don't impose this. But only when two particles are identical, you say, okay, we have to impose this extra condition on the Schrodinger wave function. So symmetrization, anti-symmetrization, namely quantum statistics in general, is not integral part of the quantum mechanics. This is something you have to impose after the fact. It turns out, once you go to quantum field theory, this is actually built in. Quantum statistics becomes a prediction of quantum field theory, not something you impose by hand after the fact. 
So that's why I have to start uh, talking about connection to statistical mechanics, because that's a, actually an integral part of quantum field theory, and you see how that comes about. But anyway, the quantum field theory has this great advantage. Even though the content turns out to be exactly equivalent to multiparticle quantum mechanics, this quantum statistics is built into the formalism from the onset. So symmetrization or anti-symmetrization is now a requirement of quantum field theory. So that's one thing that goes beyond the uh, standard quantum mechanics. And another advantage is that think about sort of systems in condensed matter physics. You are talking about Avogadro number of particles in a, uh, a system you study in the laboratory, 10 to the 23 of them. Think about writing a Schrodinger wave function, which has 10 to the, oops, I don't go, want to go to Twitter here. I should have actually turned off the notification. I apologize. Uh, OK. Good, I'm back to this. So think about writing a Schrodinger wave function, which has 6 times 10 to 23 arguments in it. That's crazy. You can't deal with that. So if you are talking about system with a macroscopic number of particles, Writing that wave function really doesn't make sense. We really need a better formalism for it so that we can deal with the situation with this large number of particles without ever writing a wave function for individual arguments for individual particle. And you will see again soon that that's what quantum field, uh, field theory does. So even though the physical content may be equivalent at the level of formulation, it has a great advantage in terms of description. It becomes a lot easier. And, and, and you know, it, it, I would say it's practically impossible to deal with the 10 to 23 particles with the Schrodinger equation, but at least that becomes a tractable problem in quantum field theory. So that's yet another difference from quantum mechanics. And so this, this is what I just said. And another thing, is, is that this is a much more versatile formulation. And, and this is difficult to explain in abstract, but you will see how that comes about later on. So that's why quantum field theory became a very important tool in condensed matter physics. Historically, quantum field theory started by trying to unify relativity and quantum mechanics in the context of electromagnetism. That's the way it came about, but it turned out to be a great tool for condensed matter physics because of these reasons. So that there's a specific need for quantum field theory. But in addition, quantum mechanics cannot deal with processes where number of particles change. And this is where quantum field theory becomes a must. So on the previous side, quantum field theory is a lot better than quantum mechanics, but maybe I shouldn't say it's a must, but here, this becomes a must. And the reason is, again, this uh, multi-particle quantum mechanics. Once you have large number of particles in a system, and suppose you could deal with a Schrodinger equation with this many arguments in it, but if you have a process where a number of particles can change, how do you deal with that? It doesn't make sense when the number of arguments of a function jumps at a point. Once you write a function, it's a function of some number of variables in it, and that's fixed. You cannot talk about function of n variables jumping to function of n plus one variables. Uh, that's at least beyond mathematics, we know. So you can't describe a process where number of particles can change using the standard quantum mechanics language. And that's where the issues come about on photoelectric effects, emission of light from atomic transitions, as well absorption of light from atomic transitions. These processes do change the number of particles, namely in this case, photon. Number of metal particles can also change. You can create a pair of a particle and antiparticle, and that's what Berkeley is famous for. Berkeley discovered antiproton up on the hill of a vivatron, anti-proton was the discovery, and, and the, and, uh, the uh, 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 Chamberlain said Gray got Nobel Prize for this. 
So uh, the number of matter particles can also change, not just the photon. And we need to have a tool to describe the process. So emission of absorption of photons is one example where number of particles can change. And they are also the creation of particle and antiparticle, as I mentioned uh, earlier. And quantum field theory had been originally designed to talk about the behavior of elementary particles, but it turns out that it can also describe immersion degrees of freedom too, like collective phenomena in condensed matter physics, or composite objects like quark and the protons and neutrons. And in those days, they didn't know the proton was made of three quarks, but now we do. And proton is made of a two up quarks and one down quark. So it's not a fundamental object. But it turns out that quantum field theory is versatile enough that you can deal with the, these kind of composite objects for in quantum field theory. You can deal with quant collective phenomena like phonons in condensed matter systems using quantum field theory. So quantum field theory not only describes fundamental degrees of freedom like photon and electron, can but also describe immersion degrees of freedom like phonon and composite degrees of freedom like a protons and neutrons. So this is what I meant by very versatile. So that's what I just said. And another example of composite states are what is called the Cooper pairs, where two electrons become sort of bound together very weakly, but nonetheless they are bound, and, and then and causes the superconductivity, and we'll come back and talk about that. So that's why this is a great tool for all physics. So whenever you have a phenomenon where a number of degrees of freedom changes, quantum mechanics just cannot do it, and you have to go to quantum field theory. And again, I welcome any questions on the way, so please chime in. And lastly, once you go to relativity, then again, quantum field theory becomes a must. So I will come back and talk about this in the second half. As I said, there had been attempts to try to extend quantum mechanics to describe a relativistic Lorentz invariant systems, but at the end of the day, it didn't work out. So you had to choose to go to quantum field theory. And one of the simple reason is this. In quantum mechanics, position is an operator, as you all know. But time is a parameter, not an operator. And if you think about relativity, we are supposed to treat space and time on equal footing, right? Because it's part of the four-dimensional space-time. But quantum mechanics, deal with them in a very different way. Position, space, is an operator. Time is a parameter. It's a classical number. Time is a classical number. X is a quantum operator. So definitely, this doesn't mesh well with the idea of dealing space and time on equal footing. QFT is a different, and this is the reason why it kind of works. So instead of talking about X as an operator, in some sense, we demote position to a parameter on an equal footing with time. Because we decide to take wave as the starting point of discussion. And wave, like electromagnetic wave, is a function of both position and time. And both position and time are parameters to describe the wave. So X is not an operator anymore. X is a classical number that points to a space-time position. And what ends up being an operator is actually phi, or vector potential, or scalar potential. So this is the difference between quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. In field theory, you start with a wave where you can treat space and time on equal footing. And that's something you have seen in Maxwell's equation already. So if you're describing wave equation, space and time can be treated on equal footing. And what becomes an operator is the wave itself. Vector potential, scalar potential, electric field, magnetic field are operators, but not X. X is a number. It's a parameter to describe the field. 
So that's why when you want to combine quantum mechanics and relativity, going to wave as a starting point really made sense. X and T can now be treated on equal footing. So that's why quantum field theory turned out to be a must. When you want to combine relativity and quantum mechanics in a single framework, there was no other choice. Quantum field theory was the way to go imposed on us. And that actually ended up giving us lots of bonuses. It gives us predictions that's not possible in quantum mechanics. For example, one prediction of the relativistic quantum field theory is what is called spin statistics theorem. So ever wondered why electron is a fermion and photon is a boson? Quantum field theory tells you that particles with half odd spins, electron has half odd spins because it's one half, has to be a fermion. Particles with integer spins, like a photon with spin one, has to be a boson. And as far as the data go, we, we certainly see no exceptions to this rule. If you look at, for example, the helium-4, which consists of four pro two protons, two neutrons, and the uh, 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 two electrons, the overall helium-4 has been zero. That's an integer. Zero is an integer, has to be a boson. And that's why helium-4 undergoes Bose-Einstein condensation and become a superfluid. So every example we know obeys this theorem, which is a prediction of relativistic quantum field theory. But at, at the level of the quantum mechanics, it seems to be an arbitrary choice. You are imposing symmetrized wave function or anti-symmetrized wave function. Which one you pick seems arbitrary choice. But once you go to relativistic quantum field theory, it's not a choice anymore. That's a requirement. So that's something you learn by going from quantum mechanics to the quantum field theory. You gain additional predictions from the new framework. Another thing I did mention already is that it allows you to predict the magnetic moment of the electron. So the magnetic moment of the electron has this G factor which I believe you have seen in quantum mechanics class. And G factor is very, to a good approximation, two. And this prediction, we can actually work out later in the class, uh, the second half of this, uh, this semester. So G factor of two is no longer something you take from the data as an input, but rather a prediction of the quantum field theory. And I mentioned earlier that G factor is not exactly two at the end of the day, and the quantum field theory allows you to predict this up to 12 significant digits. And that comes about from high order corrections in perturbation theory. And this is not something we can do in the class uh, because it's technically uh, too complicated, it takes time consuming to discuss it, but at least I can explain to you how that comes about. So G factor of two for the electron is not an input, but a prediction at the lowest order perturbation theory. We will work that out. And then you can actually talk about how this gets corrected by high order corrections in perturbation theory. At least we can sketch it, how this would come about. So it has an enormous predictive power quantum mechanics doesn't have. And also, I briefly mentioned my antiparticles as a hallmark a discovery of Berkeley. And the antiparticle had been predicted originally by Dirac with some hesitation because you know, he didn't want to speculate. But uh, at the end of the day, this was discovered. And the existence of antiparticles really came out from Dirac's effort when he tried to combine relativity and quantum mechanics together. And in the end, that became quantum field theory, which does predict every particle in nature has its antiparticle counterpart. And you will see that prediction also later in this, in this class. And there's also something called CPT theorem, which is a little bit more technically complicated. But if you actually take a system, and if you do time reversal, so all the motions are now going backwards. If you also change left and right, that's what is called the parity transformation. And furthermore, change every particle in the system by its antiparticle counterpart. So this is a product called T for time reversal, 
P for parity and C for charge conjugation, to swap particles and antiparticles. If you do all three together, that should be an invariance of any physical system. And that is what is called the CPT theorem, which has been proven in relativistic quantum field theory, but quantum mechanics does not predict that. So uh, a CPT theorem is, is, it had been tested experimentally in greater, great details. We see no exception to this rule either, which is a great evidence that quantum field theory is the right framework to describe physics in, in all areas. So, because the minute you try to put relativity and quantum mechanics together, quantum field theory is the only way to go. So QFT is a must when you go to particle physics, nuclear physics, and astrophysics, where you do have to combine relativity and quantum mechanics under a single roof. So that's basically the, my take on why you want to study quantum field theory. So I'm going to pause here and see if you guys may have uh, uh, any questions. Questions? Really? <laughs> Nothing? Just to make sure that you can hear me? Okay, good, good. I see people nodding. Good. No questions at all? Okay. Of course, this is just a spiel, and I didn't get into much content yet, so uh, maybe it's not a surprise that you don't have any questions. So uh, let me then get to the discussion on, on the review of harmonic oscillator next. So you may find it surprising, but it turns out that quantum field theory is a collection of an infinite number of harmonic oscillators. And so we, of course, do start uh, looking into quantum field theory uh, right away. But before doing so, it is probably useful to review harmonic oscillator and how that comes about from the basic Lagrangian and Hamiltonian, uh, which I believe you have studied already uh, before you take the quantum mechanics class. So let me do a brief review on this. And I think I finish up today's lecture uh, with these reviews. Okay, so I'm gonna review how you start from Lagrangian derive a Hamiltonian and canonical commutation relation, and then get the standard quantum mechanics out of that, because we use the same line of process of what we call the quantization, even when we go to the quantum field theory. So I just would like to lay out the idea of how you go from classical Lagrangian to a quantum theory in the linear process, so that we can start applying it when we go to the field theory next. Okay, so that's the purpose of this review. The first, Lagrangian. So we most of the time start a, a discussing a physical system with a Lagrangian. And the Lagrangian, is, as you know, is useful because it tells you what the Euler Lagrange equation is. So equation of motion, but back in time of Newton is something you just write by hand, F equals ma. But in now modern view is that you start with a Lagrangian and you derive equation motion as an Euler Lagrange equation from the Lagrangian. So that's why Lagrangian is a useful beginning of uh, look, looking at any uh, physical systems. At the same time, Lagrangian also tells you once you have a coordinate, what is the canonically conjugate coordinate, a momentum to it, namely that what it decides what is called the canonical structure so that you can set up the canonical commutation relation like what you do in quantum mechanics X and P. So once you have a Lagrangian, you know what P is, then you can set up the formulation from that. So th that's why Lagrangian is always the beginning of discussion in, in the course uh, 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 this semester. And the reason why Lagrangian is a useful uh, beginning of the discussion in any physical systems, a part of the reason is that it's a very useful way of capture symmetries of the system. And when you talk about non-relativistic systems, you want to make sure that your Lagrangian is invariant in many different reference frames, which is a Galilean transformation. So if you're sitting on a train, and if your train starts to move, then you might think that the next train starts to move backwards, and that's just this difference in reference frames, right? And this is the Galilean transformation going from one reference frame at rest to another reference frame at motion. 
you want to make sure your Lagrangian is invariant under that. If you go to relativity, that becomes Lorentz transformation. In one reference frame, and in a different reference frame that's moving relative to each other, that's the relativity, the physics is supposed to be identical. Uh, so the principle of relativity tells you that your system has to respect this invariance under Lorentz boost. So Lagrangian is the easiest way of capturing this symmetry. So you can make sure your Lagrangian is Lorentz invariant so that it respects full relativity uh, in your description. So that's why Lagrangian is the good starting point always. And Hamiltonian is something that gets derived from Lagrangian. And in this class, I regard Hamiltonian as a sort of derived quantity, not the fundamental quantity, because in Hamiltonian formulation, you treat time differently from space. Hamiltonian is an operator that moves time forward, as you learn in quantum mechanics class. Time derivative of the wave function is given by the Hamiltonian. Because Hamiltonian refers to a particular definition of time, it depends on your reference frame. And it makes sense because Hamiltonian is nothing but the energy of the system. And energy of the system depends on your reference frame. So Hamiltonian is not the fundamental quantity as far as this discussion goes. It's a derived quantity, rather. That's why we want to start with the Lagrangian and get the Hamiltonian out of it and use it for the purpose of doing the rest of the stuff. So we want to start with the Lagrangian. Now, when I first studied about Lagrangian, I was very puzzled by this uh, spelling. And, and, and later on, I actually uh, learned this. So Lagrangia was an Italian guy. But he later naturalized in France and became Lagrange. And that's why Lagrangian is written with I instead of E, apparently. So, uh, so uh, and I made a lot of uh, spelling mistakes when I was a grad student, but uh, th that was because this was a Mr. Lagrangia, uh, uh, as an Italian name. I don't know why Euler Lagrange equation is called Euler Lagrange rather than Lagrangia, but anyway, so th that's apparently the convention here, people adapt it. So Lagrangian is spelled this way because it's due to Mr. Lagrangia. Okay, so how do we use it? So Lagrangian is meant to be integrated over time to define the action. And Lagrangian is a function of time, but not explicitly on time. The time dependence comes from the time dependence of the coordinate inside the Lagrangian. And Lagrangian depends not only on the coordinate, but also in, on its first time derivative. And I hope you have seen this, and if you have not, please do let me know so that I can start reviewing some of the material about this as well. So Lagrangian is a function of a coordinate, which depends on time, and its first time derivative, but never on its second derivative and beyond. And this is an important point, because if Lagrangian ends up depending on second derivative and beyond, we don't know how to define the canonical momenta to set up the canonical commutation relation. There is always exception to the rule. When you go to grad level QFD class, you might start learning about uh, effective quantum field theory. And the word effective is important here, where you can deal with Lagrangian that depends on higher derivatives too. But now we are at the beginning of the QFD discussion. This is the introduction. So we stick to the simplest case. So we do require for the pur purpose of this course that Lagrangian depends only up to the first derivative of the coordinates. And once that is the case, then we know how to define the canonically conjugate momentum to the coordinate qi by taking the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to its time derivative. And that's what we always do in defining the, uh, uh, the particle mechanics. And once you do have a momentum defined this way, then you can define the Hamiltonian pq dot minus l, and Hamiltonian is meant to be a function of Q and P. It should not depend on Q dot. 
So by using the definition of the momentum PI, you try to solve for Q dot using P and rewrite the right-hand side in terms of P only. So Q dot is supposed to be eliminated and depends only on P and Q. And we go right into an example of this uh, using harmonic oscillator in a second. So once you define P and Q this way, then you know how to quantize the system and start writing the Schrodinger equation for it by setting up this canonical commutation relation between Q and P. So down to the fourth line where you define Hamiltonian, it could have been both classical or quantum mechanics. You didn't have to know. But the last line has H bar in it. This is where the quantum comes in. So now you regard Q and P as operators. You set up this quantum uh, canonical commutation relation among operators Q and P. And that's the beginning of how you quantize the system. And I believe we have all seen this in quantum mechanics uh, 137 A and B. And how this works in practice, here's an example of a harmonic oscillator. I just chose this for a multi-component harmonic oscillator, just to make it clear that I have to deal with the multiple Q and P in general. And you have this Lagrangian, that's the kinetic energy minus potential energy, as you all know. And so indeed, this is a function of X as the coordinate and X dot, the first time derivative, in as a function of uh, an argument of Lagrangian, but we don't have X double dot. Acceleration is not part of the Lagrangian, it's only coordinate position and it's first time derivative velocity. So this is an example of the Lagrangian, as you all know. With this, we follow the standard procedure. We take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the first time derivative, in this case it's X dot, and out comes MX dot, something you all, all uh, uh, know very well, P is MV. And using this relationship, we can eliminate X dot in favor of P so that we can remove X dot everywhere when you define Hamiltonian. Again, this is just doing in, 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 in too gory detail, I think. So Hamiltonian is P X dot minus L. I eliminate X dot in favor of P. So the first P X dot, I rewrite X dot in terms of P over M and minus Lagrangian. Lagrangian contains X dot as well. So I rewrite each X dot as P over M minus potential energy. And then the, the first term in the Lagrangian kinetic energy piece cancels a half of P X dot. So that ends up being the kinetic energy itself and potential energy as a result flips its sign. So the Hamiltonian is now a sum of the kinetic energy and potential energy. But the point here is that Hamiltonian is now a function of X and P. It doesn't involve any time derivative in it. And once you have the Hamiltonian, then you know how to set up this canonical commutation relation and jump into the Schrodinger equation. And you know this very well. So the Schrodinger equation in general uh, takes this form that if we have a state re represented as a ket, its time derivative is given by the Hamiltonian acting on that ket. So this is where I refer to the fact that Hamiltonian is really specific to a choice of your time coordinate. So if you go to different reference frame in a relativistic system, your time coordinate becomes different and Hamiltonian should change accordingly too. That's why I don't regard Hamiltonian to be the fundamental quantity for this uh, purpose of discussion and rather derived quantity. So I always go back to Lagrangian, derive the Hamiltonian out of it, and then set up the Schrodinger equation every single time. So that's why I always go refer back to the Lagrangian. But once you do have a Lagrangian, you go through the process from the previous slide, define the Hamiltonian, define the canonical uh, commutation relation, and then you can jump ahead and write the Schrodinger equation, which you know and love, together with this commutation relation. And the reason why this commutation relation is important, because we can go to the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the coordinate basis or momentum basis, whichever you like, and because of the canonical commutation relation, you know the momentum operator can be represented 
as the derivative operator in the position space uh, uh, description. And because Hamiltonian is a function of Q and P, once you represent the state in terms of the co uh, coordinate space, which is the usual wave function, you know how to rewrite the Schrodinger equation using this differential equation, where you replace every occurrence of momentum in terms of h bar over i times the, the derivative operator. And you have seen this many times. And if you apply this process to the harmonic oscillator, and then you know the standard, the Schrodinger equation. So the left-hand side of the equation is just time derivative acting on the state in the coordinate representation. Right-hand side of the equation is where I have the Hamiltonian, but now Hamiltonian is a differential operator because I replace P in terms of h bar over i times the spatial derivative. And this is the expression you have dealt with many times over in quantum mechanics class by solving the differential equation. And then you go ahead and start talking about the stationary states. And in order to solve this differential equation, then Hamiltonian can have these eigenstates where certain states can have a particular value for the Hamiltonian. Then solving this equation becomes kind of trivial because time derivative is just a number. So it just goes with the phase uh, according to time evolution uh, with a specified energy eigenvalue. So if you do this for the harmonic oscillator, and once you have this energy eigenstate of this Hamiltonian operator, and which is comes off to the uh, solving this differential equation, and then you learn that they are given in terms of Hermit polynomials. And once you have these polynomials, then uh, you can write down the time evolution according to the Schrodinger equation. And you also obtain these energy eigenvalues. So that's the way quantum mechanics works, which I believe you know already uh, uh, to your heart. And we start applying this to the quantum field theory. Uh, so starting with field instead of particles in the Lagrangian and we got, go ahead and quantize it. Okay, so I think this is the end of my lecture today. And I, I stop here and, and the pause for questions. Hey, any questions about what we discussed today? Uh, this is just a logistical question. The slides are on the B courses, right? I will post the slides after the classes on B courses, yes. Okay. And also Thank the video. You. I hope that came out okay. Any further questions? Thank you. I have a question about uh, what you mentioned about the Hamiltonian and Lagrangian or the difference between those two. Um, I think you mentioned that the Hamiltonian is, you, you don't regard the Hamiltonian as a fundamental quantity. And mm -hmm. it, does, does that mean you use um, the Lagrangian is uh, like fundamental quantity or but what's the actual, what, what do you mean by the fundamental quantity there? So, so attitude here is that to specify a physical system means specifying the Lagrangian. Once you write the Lagrangian, that specifies the system. And then given the Lagrangian, you go through this process I mentioned, derive the Hamiltonian, set up the canonical computation relation, write the Schrodinger equation, and then voila, that's the quantum theory. So we always, take Lagrangian as the beginning. Writing the Lagrangian is the same thing as specifying physics. And out comes the, 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 the time evolution equation, energy eigenvalues, and all this as a prediction of the Lagrangian. So this is the attitude we take. Lagrangian is some fundamental quantity that describes a physical system. And everything else follows. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. OK. Any further discussions? I see the people already signing off, moving to another class, I guess. And does any of you have problem with the, the Lagrangian Hamiltonian, this kind of formulation? Have you all seen this? Um, oh. Could you maybe briefly go over the canonical quantization again? Okay, then what I can do is to ask actually Reggie to go over this canonical formulation uh, uh, during discussion section. 
And I also post my uh, lecture notes I have written for actually 221 A and B on quantum mechanics class about this on, on post them on B courses so you can read up on it. Okay. Is that a good way of handling it? Okay. Yes. Any further questions here? Yeah. Do we also uh, always need to like do the QFT by canonical quantization? Because I yes. think we can also like formulate. Oh, okay. So there's no way to use passing to integral here. Like oh, there is, there is. The yeah, you can you can formulate quantum field theory with a path integral too. Uh, I I'm avoiding it for the proofs of this class, part, because of two reasons. One of them is that it's not strictly needed, even though the path integral formulation turns out to be extremely useful, and uh, especially when you go to grad level, you probably see that a lot more. But it's it's not strictly necessary, and second depends on what quantum mechanics book you use, you may or may not have seen path integral. So it probably varies uh, even in, this, in the same class here. So that's why I'm entirely avoiding path integral uh, 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 from the course this semester. And, uh, uh, and, and the book does have it, so you can, you're welcome to actually look into it, but I'm not going to use path integral and strictly stick to canonical formulation. Okay, cool, thank you. Any further questions? Okay, so don't forget to fill out Doodle polls. And as I said, uh, I welcome feedbacks on, on the speed I'm going with, the preparation of slides, the way the lectures are structured. And also I need to learn how to do the polls properly <laughs> from the next time. And uh, uh, so, yeah, so uh, see you again on Friday. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.